Good evening, everybody. I'm, call I'm calling this meeting to order. Welcome to the council meeting of August 21st, 2017. Madam Clerk, have we met all the noticing requirements for this meeting? We have, Mayor. And please call the roll. Ms. Howard? Here. Mr. Liverman? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Crum Miller? Here. Ms. Butler? Here. Mr. Quinn? Here. And Mayor Lemper? Here. Um, and tonight is a special night. Um, as you see, we have many more police officers here than we normally do um, because we're going to be swearing in five new officers. And I'd like to turn the meeting over to Chief Sutter to introduce us to them. Or post the colors, please. Please be seated. Okay. Mayor, members of council, honored guests, I'm privileged to be with you tonight for the swearing in of our newest officers, Ryan McDermott, Ashley Gaylord, Michael Maselli, James Euphemia, and Adam Santos. It's an exciting night not only for them, but also for the police department and the community. These five individuals represent future policing in Princeton. I want to start by acknowledging the demanding process these officers successfully navigated to earn the honor of standing before you tonight. They were five of over 800 original candidates that applied for positions with our department. They were required to pass a written exam, a physical fitness test, two arduous panel interviews, a background investigation, and finally two more interviews final, uh, prior to appointment. The process is designed to challenge the candidates at each phase and ultimately identify the high, highest caliber officer that will represent the ideals and standards of our department and of our community. And I'm absolutely confident that this process was successful with respect to these five individuals. I could certainly speak at length about each of these officers, their morally strong and diverse backgrounds, their educational and career accomplishments, and their strong sense of community and commitment to service. But I'm assured that we will soon see their actions speak much louder than my words as they begin their service to our community. Finally, I want to share a few thoughts with our new officers. You're answering a calling that carries with it great burden, sacrifice, but also incredible reward and honor. The challenges that you will face are without a doubt more complex than we in law enforcement have ever faced before. It has never been more important for you to perform your duties and fulfill your oath with the utmost of professionalism, integrity, and compassion. At times, you're going to be called upon to take the role of a social worker, a mental health professional, a marriage counselor, and at times, a mother, father, a sister, or a brother. What I'm basically telling you is that you have to be whoever and whatever it takes to get the job done. It may sound overwhelming, but eventually it will be a natural occurrence for you because of who you are and the path you have chosen to follow. And rest assured that you will always have our full support and we'll be with you in all that you do. So I wish you all a very long, happy, healthy, and safe career with our department, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to work with you all. Good luck. And our first candidate to be sworn in will be James Euphemia. James, would you come forward with your family, please? 
And I want to invite the rest of council down with me to congratulate the offers afterwards. Do it over here so everybody let's go side okay. by side. Sure about that. Right over here. There you go. Y'all want to hold it together? Sure. Oh, stand here? Yeah. Left hand, right hand up. But you should stand here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we switch around so people can see you? Yeah. So we can get Sorry pictures. to, yeah. Right. You should stand here. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Um, please repeat after me. I, James Euphemia. I, James Euphemia. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially and justly. Impartially and justly. Perform all the duties of probationary officer. Perform all the duties of probationary officer. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Our next candidate, Ashley Gaylord. Ashley, please come forward with your family, please. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a lot of traffic. <laughs> uh, traffic cop here. up there. <laughs> well, the cops are here, so you need to direct the traffic. I, Ashley Gaylord. I, Ashley Gaylord. Do you solemnly swear. Do you solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in the state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I will faithfully, that I will faithfully, impartially and justly, impartially and justly, perform all the duties of probationary officer, perform all the duties of probationary officer, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Would our next candidate, Ryan McDermott, please step forward with your family? I, Ryan McDermott. I, Ryan McDermott. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. 
I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear that I will faithfully that I will faithfully impartially and justly impartially and justly perform all the duties of probationary officer perform all the duties of a probationary officer according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability so help me God so help me God congratulations Thank you. Would our next candidate, Michael Maselli, please step forward with your family? I, Michael Maselli. I, Michael Maselli. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the government established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I will faithfully, that I will faithfully, impartially and justly, impartially and justly, perform all the duties of probationary officer, perform all the duties of probationary officer, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Adam Santos, please step forward with your family. I, Adam Santos. I, Adam Santos. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. I do further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially and justly. Impartially and justly. Perform all the duties of probationary officer. Perform all the duties of probationary officer. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Welcome. So that'll conclude our ceremony for tonight. I want to thank everybody. Um, as I always say, they're now part of our family. You're now part of our family. So if, should you ever need anything at all, we're always here to support them as well as you. So um, I just wish you one last thing to be safe and remember this day always as you go on through your careers, okay? Best of luck.
All right, we're gonna um, go back and resume our meeting. Um, we'll move on with announcements. Ms. Howard, any announcements this evening? Mr. Liverman, Mr. Miller, Mr. Crum Miller, Ms. Butler, any announcements? Mr. Quinn, any announcements? Uh, no. Oh no, okay. Um, do you have a couple? It'd be, it'd be, it would help me because I'm still pulling mine up because I have a few. I, I was, <laughs> I, I was, I, ha, I would like to make one announcement actually while we have everyone's attention. If I can find mine, I don't know if your enough. mic is on. It is, um, just not close enough. Hold on, just one second. I wanted to mention that um, the pool will be open for um, Monday. Labor Day, September 4th, but it will also be, it's, and will also be open from 11 to 5 on September 9th and 10th. So we've added an additional weekend to the um, pool season. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, I had a couple announcements. Um, the first is um, I'll be holding my regular Meet the Mayor office hours, open office hours in the library lobby this Friday. Um, August 25th from 8.30 to 10 a.m. Um, and then following day on Saturday, I'll be doing a walk and talk with uh, the Olivia's Wellness Connection, um, and that's at 8 a.m. Um, and we'll be meeting at the Community Park South uh, by the tennis courts. So um, uh, please come by if you have questions or have an idea um, or concern about anything. Um, the other thing I just wanted to um, mention was that we have a three-week gap. Um, normally, we meet every other week, but we have a three-week gap between this meeting and our next meeting because of the way the, um, essentially the way the August calendar is. So our next meeting will be on September 11th. And between now and then, I just wanted to wish everybody a happy Labor Day and good luck to our students who are starting the school year. Um, are there any staff announcements? No? Okay. Um, then we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Um, we have a, cl a closed session minutes for the meeting of May 22nd, 2017, and also the regular um, session meetings, uh, minutes from that same meeting, May 22nd, 2017. Um, is there a motion to approve both? So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Crummeller and seconded by Mr. Liverman. Any corrections on the minutes? Uh, Ms. Butler? Uh, Oh, I was just going to say Heather and I were absent, so we'll be I'm, I'm abstaining. Be abstaining. Okay. Yes. Um, then all in favor? Aye. 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 So um, there are four in favor and um, two abstentions from Ms. Butler and Ms. Howard. <clears throat> um, and now we move on to comments from the public for items that are not already on the agenda. And we're going to start with um, the folks that signed the sign-up sheet, and then I'll open it up to anybody else who'd like to speak. So first is Paul Driscoll. I'm just going to interrupt you. You got to, there's some people who get too close and there's other people who are too far. So just get really close. <laughs> it on, on. Let's start over again. Good evening. I speak to the urgent need for Princeton to establish a comprehensive 24 seven fire safety ordinance of its own, which is tailored to meet the individual needs of our town. I understand that council has determined that all fire and safety issues should be handled at a state level and that priority for this topic will be reconsidered in 2018. Actually, as this is a critical health and safety issue which impacts the lives of many Princeton residents, I would like to ask if council members can rethink their position at this time or at least over the next couple of days, week, whatever. As most of you know, a number of citizens have been continuously working with many state officials and legislators on New Jersey fire and safety codes for the past two and a half years. 
This complex and multifaceted issue at first may confuse some as to who has jurisdiction over what. Although building code regulations for permitted construction must be determined at the state level, municipalities do have complete jurisdiction to develop a local ordinance for 24-7 fire safety to oversee building sites for residential and commercial buildings during construction. It is important to have a clear, comprehensive ordinance very soon for many reasons. While it is true that Assembly Speaker Prieto has introduced Bill A97 outlining 24-7 uh, fire safety procedures, that's this bill here. It is comparatively watered down at best and may never be passed at all. Um, it only specifies that uh, one man be assigned who has expertise in, in a fire watch situation, but that's essentially what happened at Maplewood, and as we all know, that didn't really stop the fire. So we need to have a local ordinance which specifically addresses the needs of our community and can be enforced by local officials. As we have seen from past projects, if state regulations for safety measures are unclear or nonspecific, they're impossible to enforce. We should be prepared. Several sites situated in high-density neighborhoods of Princeton have been proposed for future development of multifamily housing. This places many nearby res residents at risk if a potentially damaging construction fire breaks out. Earlier this year, there was a massive construction fire in Kansas City, which spread to 22 surrounding homes. People were hosing down their roofs to protect their houses. If this were to happen in Princeton, would people be so lucky to even have water available to them? We must have a specific ordinance which is fully enforceable at the time these proposed multifamily structures are scheduled to be built. As Princeton is ahead of most municipalities in the ability to meet affordable housing requirements and is growing faster than some other New Jersey towns, it is all the more important for us to lead the way on establishing a 24-7 fire safety ordinance. Cities and towns must respond immediately when massive fires break out, not state officials. In Princeton, we have a detailed draft of a proposed fire safety or ordinance, which I have attached. So much of the initial work has been done, although there are some adjustments that are needed. The other big component of fire and safety is the building constru construction codes, which are, which are state controlled. However, legislators are looking for direction from the League of Municipalities, which, were, is, which is where Princeton can lead and exert major influence. Local citizens support the bipartisan Turner Bateman's Wicker Bill, S1632, A3770, which calls for much tougher fire and safety codes as outlined in the attached nine-point summary. Here is where the League of Municipalities and Princeton can take a more active role in joining citizens to see that this bill is passed. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, Kip Cherry. Kip Cherry, 24 Dempsey Avenue, and I'd like to follow up on Paul's comments. I'd like to speak tonight on fire safety and why this should be a high priority for Princeton Council's consideration right now. I'd like to thank you for your leadership in this area and urge you to do much more. I think there is a notion that the, that the issue is a state issue and not a local issue, but it is very local as all fires are. As you know, recent multifamily construction here in Princeton, as well as elsewhere, has utilized lightweight wood construction, which is very flammable. And when such fires happen, it is the local fire department, the local volunteers, who must fight the fire. And I can tell you that there is great concern amongst firemen and women about these fires, and many fire departments will not enter these buildings when they are on fire. I encourage you to reach out to our fire department and learn more about this. There have been numerous conflagrations around the country involving this type of construction, including three terrible fires in New Jersey. These terrible fires have included apartment complexes, condominiums, residence halls, and senior living facilities. 
Beyond the threats to the lives of our firemen, these fires are very devastating to those who live in the burned out buildings. So far, most of the time, residents have gotten out with their lives, although there have been deaths. Uniformly, these fires are so very hot and hard to put out that the residents lose everything they own, everything, even their pets. There are two points when lightweight wood construction can be prone to major fires. One point is at the front end during construction, uh, which is our largely regulated locally. The other is during uh, the completion, after the completion of the building. You are correct that completed buildings are subject to the state building code. There are several bills pending in the legislature, and uh, Paul has just mentioned the one that's very important, A3770 S1632, which uh, was put into the hopper by some of our local representatives, Moyo, Gasiora, Swicker, Turner, Bateman, and Weinberg. And they all need your help, your leadership, in securing the support of the League of Municipalities and the Conference of Mayors for this bill. The other point at which lightweight wood construction is subject to terrible fires is during construction. This is where the town and all of you on council have the most responsibility and opportunity. Those of us very concerned about this issue have prepared a detailed enforceable ordinance to cover the construction period, which is a local responsibility, not a state responsibility. Prado's bill that Paul mentioned was for a fire watch, for instance, contains no details and is not really enforceable because there's no detail to enforce. I should add that Maplewood, as I think Paul mentioned, had a fire watch and yet the place burned down. The concept behind the ordinance is to give our hardworking fire safety inspectors codified procedures to prevent fires during lightweight wood construction and to maximize the protection we have for our firemen and, and women and to our residents whose homes and businesses surround the lightweight wood construction development. Paul has handed out copies to you of the draft ordinance, which is developed in close consultation with local Princeton professionals. It is really a no-brainer. It would make our town safer if you adopt it. Let me give you an example of what having an ordinance in place can do. During the construction of a lightweight wood complex here in Princeton, a terrible fire occurred in Maplewood, as you know. Uh, we were able to figure out at the, that the fire was uh, probably created by um, a series of uh, heaters uh, drying the drywall. So on that basis, we looked at the project here in Princeton and discovered that there were similar tanks on the site. We brought photographs of those tanks to uh, you guys in council, and miraculously, within a couple days, the tanks had disappeared. Um, at that time, we talked about the fact that we were proposing a new ordinance and that um, this would be something that would be covered in the new ordinance. So that's the power of an ordinance. Uh, developers do recognize that there are safety issues, and if they're enforced by ordinance, they will uh, respond to that. So again, we ask you to pass without, uh, proceed with uh, passing the ordinance as a town responsibility to give your fire safety inspectors unquestionable authority on specific issues such as inspecting and possibly requiring to replace such things as propane hoses. We want to encourage you to get our house in order to prepare for the affordable housing construction effort that lies before us, which almost certainly will be lightweight wood construction. The ordinance is already written in draft form. Now would be a good time to get uh, fire safety construction ordinance in place so that developers looking at Princeton know what our fire safety requirements are well in advance. And I thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Kate Warren. And I should mention the buzzer keeps going off because it's set for three minutes. So I ask that you try to keep your comments to three minutes, although we do want to hear what you have to say. So. I thought it was a fire drill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, Kate Warren, Jefferson Road. It's clear that the use of light frame wood construction has brought serious ramifications to communities across the United States. Residents of New Jersey have experienced the horrendous fires resulting from light frame wood construction that occurred in Edgewater and Maplewood and have seen the devastation of these fires across the nation. On March 28, 2016, as a result of the Edgewater, New Jersey fire that displaced over 500 residents, I appeared before mayor and council requesting the passage of Resolution 16105, quote, to urge for the swift passage of S1632 to provide municipalities with an additional tool to reduce the risk of massive fires and for the protection of residents, public safety, personnel, and property, close quote. Nearly a year later, in February 2017, as a result of yet another light frame wood construction fire that occurred in Maplewood, New Jersey, I stood here again asking that you address an immediate public safety issue, namely the stagnation of S1632, 
slash A3700 that sits stalled in committee. And now, 17 months later, after my first appearance on this issue, sadly, this important legislation, which addresses a public safety issue, not only for tenants and homeowners and their personal property, but for first responders who bravely give so freely of themselves to protect others, remains stalled with no hopes of passing any time in the foreseeable future. It is clear that one of the major obstacles in the driving force in this stagnation is cost. Building industry lobbyists are working overtime to protect the vested interest of an industry that is putting profit ahead of safety. S1632 addresses the concern I'm here to address this evening, the requirement that, quote, residential group R2 structure light frame wood construction projects be monitored by fire watch guards 24 hours a day, seven days a week, close quote. It further requires that, quote, a fire watch guard be present from the time construction begins until 48 hours after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, close quote. In addition, quote, a fire watch guard would also be responsible for ensuring that all construction code requirements are followed with respect to any hot work on the construction site, close quote. There's no need here to hire a wordsmith. The language for 24-7 fire watch ordinance exists. What's needed, however, is an immediate directive to municipal staff to create the document that will demonstrate again that Princeton leads while others follow. We have listened to Kip and Paul clearly articulate the need for the fire watch ordinance and the urgency of its passage as we move toward the likely development of an additional 40 affordable units at the Princeton Community Village. And on the horizon, we rate the redevelopment of the Maple Franklin units owned by Princeton Housing Authority and the likely development of the adjoining parking lot, as well as the proposed senior housing project at the um, shopping center. If you choose not to deal with the fire safety measure intended to prevent ignition of an uncontrollable fire, then you give up your right of control over the issue. This matter must, be, must not be tabled until next year and be subjected to the lengthy annual priority discussions that take place. At that time, there will be two new members of council who have no or little understanding of this important issue. You have an opportunity to act now. You need not rely upon and wait for the state legislator to protect the residents of Princeton. It's your responsibility to do what's necessary locally to ensure the greatest protection for our volunteer first responders and the community as a whole. A year from now, you may wish that you had taken action now. We have all experienced the failure to have what is necessary in place before a developer comes to town with plans in hand. The wise counsel I received as a child and young adult evoke fond memories of my mother and father. More importantly, their words resound loud and clear this evening. Don't put off until tomorrow what can be done today. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, I, I'll just, um, is, was there anybody else who'd like to speak to this particular no, issue? <laughs> What's that? Everybody else is on vacation. Everyone's also on vacation, okay. Um, well, I, I just wanted to respond a bit. So Jenny and I met with, several people in your group. I think Alexi Asmus was part of that meeting too, um, along with our professional staff, maybe six or nine months ago about this issue. And um, we talked about um, a possible ordinance and our understanding from that meeting from our professional staff was that the current ordinance gave them the flexibility um, and the authority they felt they needed and that they've been able to use in the past to keep things safe and that their concern was if we actually codified an ordinance, it potentially tie their hands. I don't know if I heard that correctly or not or if that's Jenny's impression. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I feel like if this is an important issue to this group, I think it's worth it to put it back on the list for council for 2018 as we go through our priorities. We always are asking the public for things that be, should be put on that list. But I don't know if Jenny. That's my understanding too, that we we can call for a 24 hour watch if, um, if our fire officials feel it's necessary. So isn't that what? Under, current under the current ordinance. I mean, so. Yeah, Mr. Again, Mary, Mr. DeShield, yeah. Uh, you are correct. Um, between the fire officials and our construction code official, um, they do have a lot of flexibility in what they can do. Um, and at this time, they believe um, that flexibility really makes them able to really better control the um, situation on the work site at this point. Um, and they would, they would prefer to have that, the, that flexibility in order to move forward. 
Um, okay, but uh, you know, I think the request was that we think about it. So I would encourage council to think about it, reach out to this group. Um, it's not on our agenda tonight, so I don't want to get into a real deep work session, but we'll be in communication. And if there's someone on council who wants to champion this this year, um, you know, we can see if it can fit into the schedule. The problem is that we do have a pretty packed schedule. Yeah. August has been a bit light, but starting in September, um, we are going to be pretty full. Um, and then for those of us who are staying on until next year, if there's somebody who wants to um, seize on to it too. But I want to thank you. This is a very important issue. I don't think there's anybody up here who doesn't agree with you on the fundamental goal, which is to keep the community safe when we have construction projects going on. So I want to thank you for your work and your right, research. Sir, we'll OK, thanks. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to speak to any issue that's not already on the agenda? Come on up. And if you can please um, state your name and address yeah. the record. Uh, Gina Romero with Food and Water Watch, uh, our environmental nonprofit. I don't live in Princeton, but this is one of the areas that I cover as an organizer. And I'm sorry, most people I tell to talk louder, but I'm just going to ask you to just back off like an inch. <laughs> you got it. Uh, first, I want to thank the council for uh, passing a resolution opposing the uh, Transco compressor station uh, proposed for Trap Rock Quarry on the other side of town in Franklin. Um, uh, I will come back to that. Uh, the other thing you have in front of you is uh, an elected official pledge called the Off Fossil Fuels Pledge. Um, basically, this is the same uh, resolution that the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, passed earlier this year, the nonpartisan, bipartisan group of mayors calling for 100 percent renewable energy by 2035. Uh, at Food and Water Watch, we, uh, and with other groups that we're partnering with, like the National Nurses United, um, Progressive Democrats of America, uh, Our Revolution, uh, we thought, why not uh, ask our local elected officials and council members and state legislators um, who also support the U.S. Conference of Mayors' uh, goal of 100% uh, renewable energy by 2035. And uh, the list of elected officials that you have in front of you, uh, it's front and back, is all the ones in New Jersey that have signed on. Some familiar names you'll see here in Franklin Township. Every single council member and mayor in Franklin Township has signed on. And you also have the pledge there with you. Uh, basically, it says, do you support this very progressive goal, probably the most progressive uh, renewable energy goal uh, out of out of anyone you'll see, do you accept the science behind uh, climate change, which I'm very uh, certain each of y'all do, and will you oppose any additional additional fossil fuel uh, infrastructure projects in your community? And I think uh, this resolution opposing the compressor station um, shows um, how far this council is willing to go in opposing these projects. And this is a pledge that e uh, each individual council member can sign on. It's not a, a legally binding uh, resolution or anything, uh, but it just helps us build momentum uh, against a gubernatorial administration that doesn't believe the science behind climate change and a presidential one. I don't have too much time, uh, but I do also want to uh, go over this compressor station uh, thing at Food and Water Watch, partnering with other groups like uh, Rethink Energy, Sierra Club, uh, League of Conservation Voters. We've been opposing this compressor station since the beginning, since we first heard about it. Um, they've been thinking about moving these locations from one to the other. Now they've, at, now they've settled on one here at the Trap Rock Quarry location. We're going to have an educational event uh, in mid-September. Um, uh, you know, at one of them we had 300 people, at the other we had 200. We want to make this big. The venue holds 250 people. We have commitments from uh, from the Township of South Brunswick and the Townships of Franklin. Uh, they, I believe they have a Nexus tool where they can reach out to their residents uh, to get them out to events like these. And uh, I was hoping the council would consider uh, also uh, helping us with promotion for this educational event, uh, perhaps putting it on your website or if you also have an outreach tool like that. Uh, if anyone wants to sign the pledge, I will stay after the, the council uh, council meeting. Uh, and if there's any other questions, I'll gladly stay, stay at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would, oh, can you just repeat your name slowly so we can get it down for the minute? Junior Romero. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I would um, ask Mr. Quinn, actually, if he could take this to the Environmental Commission. Um, you know, one of the things that were um, at the beginning stages of is a climate action plan, and we're working actually with a group of Princeton University students as part of their Tiger Challenge, um, how to put together a climate action plan that 
the community will actually follow. Um, and I want to honor those efforts. So, I mean, I think in theory, most of us would support this goal, but I don't know if we want to make an empty promise either, not empty, but a, a pledge that we haven't had the backup to. And so, um, you know, I would, I would just ask the Environmental Commission for their um, guidance on this, whether it's better to join forces with these other communities, which I think has its own importance, um, or whether it's better for us to do it as part of our own process. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it to the next meeting of the Environmental Commission and uh, ask for a recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, is there anybody else who'd like to speak to any items that are not already on the agenda? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public comment and we'll move on to reports. And our first report tonight is from Chief Setter for the 2017 June police report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple things. Um, first, just wanted to say uh, today's event was uh, the, the Eclipse viewing event was just outstanding. It had a, um, a huge turnout, but I was um, just relaying to Councilman Quinn. It had such a community feel to it. Uh, everybody was like really energetic and friendly. It just had a great, great environment today. So our officers really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was just a great event overall. So it really turned out to be a um, something a lot, and it was one of our officers first day on the road so it was a good way to introduce her to the uh to the community it was perfect i offered her my <laughs> special glasses to look through them she's like i'm on duty <laughs> I'm like it's okay know, it's not a trap a but she yeah. was very dedicated <laughs> yes so that was just a uh, an observation it was really a good day um with regard to the report, just a few comments. Um, I just wanted to bring attention to our, um, our speeding enforcement. You can see um, that with regard to, in relationship to last year, our enforcement is really um, up because we're, we're really targeting that problem because it's our, one of our biggest problems, if not the most complaints we get. So we're really, um, it's a multifaceted approach too. It's not just enforcement. We're doing um, a lot of d data gathering, analyzing, and trying to specifically go to the really problem areas that we're, we're having. So um, it's really a, unfortunately, it's really a, a never-ending cycle. We kind of rectify problems through enforcement, and they seem to, over time, come back. So we try to look for other, other ways of, um, of doing it, one through the speed signs. Um, we now have variable message boards that we, uh, they're, they're the boards that put up, um, uh, we can put information out for events, but we can also collect speed from it and put out messages on roads, watch your speed, children present, or whatever the case may be. So it's really educational, um, is a way that we're trying to combat this, but it's definitely, we're still getting a lot of complaints with regard to the speeding, but we're out there and we're trying to, to really combat it. Um, the other thing, I. I I added a, um, a twist to this report at the end. You'll see six new reports that I put in. This, so th the reason I did this, um, Ms. Crum Miller had brought up, I believe at the last meeting, that it would be useful to look at the demographic information on um, things like marijuana arrests and use of force, for example. But we have been, uh, you've heard me mention our risk assessment committee. We have been analyzing these things for several years now in, in this respect. So every quarter, it's a peer assessment group that gets together and we look at um, high risk and liability things and we also look at um, things like um, uh, bias-based policing. And what we're looking for are trends in the aggregate and we're looking for trends as individual officers. So we actually have developed, um, one of our officers, Lieutenant Morgan, actually put together an algorithm that can look for trends across these different areas with regards to demographics. So it'll identify what, what we found out through our, our research and um, our learning curve here is that um, when there are problems in, with policing, especially on the individual level, you won't see it in one area. So with bias-based policing, usually you will not just see it in motor vehicle stops, but you'll see it in 
arrests or use of force. So when you, if this algorithm was to identify, you know, two or three different areas, it would cause us to then dig into each individual incident. We would look at the video from our cars. We would look at, um, you know, all types of different things. So this is like a early intervention flag that would come up. We're also looking at that department wide. So to that end, these are the things that we're looking at. So we're looking at demographics on use of force, but I, I want to point out as I go through this, what the overall actual, I have percentages, but to give you an idea of what the actual numbers would be. So like with use of force this year, you're talking about nine total incidents. Okay, but we broke that out. Um, pedestrian stops, pedestrian stops are things like um, riding a bike on the sidewalk and we get a lot of complaints about people riding in the CBD on the sidewalk. So our officers will go on foot and usually warn people, but we track that, who's being stopped What's the disposition of that? Things like um, pedestrian safety issues, we'll stop people and talk to them. And we capture that information, demographics. Um, probable cause searches, those are searches that um, an officer is engaged in either call somewhere or stop someone and develops um, probable cause to uh, believe that there's um, criminal activity taking place, which will result in a search a Fourth Amendment search uh, exception, search warrant exception. We track that information. We track those searches get reviewed six different ways, actually. So they go through a meaningful review process regardless of their outcome. So we look at them through um, throughout the ranks and uh, from sergeant through me, and they're reviewed and documented. And then we capture that information. So there you're probably talking in a, in a half a year uh, somewhere in the 20s. Not, you know, so you're not talking about a halt, maybe 25 or so of those incidents. Marijuana arrests, um, the same thing. And, and let me back up. You may ask why these specific ones. These are the specific areas that the ACLU, New Jersey ACLU used in one of their recent reports on bias-based policing. They identified these areas as being concerning um, for some police departments, and we said, what better really thing to use in those those categories and we've discussed that here so um, marijuana arrests you were talking a total of 52 in this half a year that are included in the report um, overall arrests 250 just to give you numbers and consent searches were very few I think there was under 10 of those a consent search by law is a search where an officer by law has to develop reasonable suspicion D these different thresholds I'm sorry for the legal terms but reasonable suspicion to believe that there's um, criminal activity taking place, and then they'll go through a process to ask a person if they will consent to a search. Um, they're very few. Usually our searches are based on um, observation of a crime, and uh, they result in a, in a search, whether it be, um, well, you know, it could run the gamut. But so every quarter I thought to let the public, these are all internal tools that we're using that we were capturing and we have. So based on our conversation, I just thought I would include that when we, um, each time we have a risk assessment committee, I'll just put the um, demographics that we capture out and the public can go online and, and see it and we'll put an explanation to it here. You know, that's really, oh, sorry. Oh, I just wanna say, yay, that's really great. Um, I do, I, 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 I think it also would probably be helpful for the public, especially to put the total numbers, because I, I think that would help, you know, when two people um, skews it, it can... When I was viewing it, uh, when I read it, the report, when I was done, I, was, I said I should have put the total, we should have put the total numbers in, so yeah. I'll change that. We, we have that, I just... Yeah, for, I know, it's, it's just a little, easier. it's a little thing that will help. Yeah. It, but I, thank you so much, it's great. Absolutely. As usual. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's great too, and I think it really confirms what you've said now that you've created, you've had internally this baseline, again, this, this, this early warning system, but it allows the public to appreciate and understand what's, what's going on there. So two, two questions. One, it was so great to see the new officers tonight. Can you remind us um, where they are in the process of being out in the public? How many are starting on patrol and how many are going to, because that was an open question, and how many are going to academy? Absolutely. So. Um... Ashley Gaylord is certified and her first day in F, uh, field training was today. So that was actually her first day on the road. Um, she, that's like a, for her it'll be about a five month process or so until she's on her own as they say and can work without a training officer. Um, the uh, Ryan McDermott 
and Adam Santos have to go through full academy. That, is start, that starts October 10th. So we usually estimate that's about a five, six month process. And it's almost a year until, a little less, until they should be um, ready to go, maybe a little bit less uh, than that. And then um, Michael Maselli and James Euphemia, um, because of their prior employment, they got a partial waiver from the New Jersey State Police Training Commission, which means they have to go to certain specific training at the academy and they basically get credit for some of the, it's very, it's very little, but um, their training will be a little bit less. So they're about two months academy total. And then they'll be in field training and ready to go. We're also um, trying to use them while they're um, waiting for the academy in different areas that we need help, you know, around the department. So they're getting exposed to a lot of different things. So we're talking for, it's kind of staggered. So two of them about a year, two of them about maybe six months, and then actually a little bit less than that. Great. Okay, good. So we're all going to look forward to seeing them out and about in different stages. And finally, I thought it might be helpful if you could update folks up here and in the public about something we talked about a couple months ago that you were going to be revisiting and revising your um, order, your police directive related to immigration. And maybe you could just update on the process you've undertaken sure. to do that. I mean, just and just to remind folks, you were getting asked by other towns, can you share your immigration order? And at the same time, the ACLU came and had some suggestions for ways it could be updated. So all those forces sort of came together and you said time probably, it's a couple years old, time to revisit, so. Yes, absolutely. So um, as you know, in 2013, we had our, um, our initial order and training uh, um, on, them, on immigration issues. And that's exactly what happened. In the beginning of this year, there was a really a statewide push by a lot of departments, I think specifically from the ACLU, to kind of put in place an order. And we had one, so we were like, oh, we're ahead of the curve, but um, they had some suggestions. So we did um, meet with representatives of the ACLU um, and um, New Jersey. Uh, Al um, Alliance for Immigrant Justice. Yes, they each had um, templates, if you will, of suggestions for an order. We um, reviewed those, talked to immigration experts, as we did last time, to vet out some of the suggestions. Um, they're really the, the things that we included were really um, language, but there were two specific things that I thought were great. Um, one was reporting. So uh, our order now requires us to publicly report. We'll do it in our police report. Um, I believe it's quarterly. I have to re uh, revisit that on um, immigration issues that have occurred in the, in the town. So we'll simply put a report together. Um, we haven't had you but know, a, if it's a zero, detainer it's, request or those kind of yeah, things. Any yeah, any type of action that may take place that comes to our knowledge will report to the uh, council, mayor and council, and to the public on, on those um, things that occurred. Just report the numbers that occurred. Um, this, the second thing is uh, U visas. U visas we've been doing for many, many years, and I never thought of it as a, it was always a, a process that we had that we never reduced to writing. And very simply, U visas are used in, um, for victims and witnesses of usually serious crimes that um, are um, looking to get uh, permanent status or some form of status uh, that the government will grant because of their um, cooperation with the criminal justice system in, in a criminal justice matter. So simply what happens is I'll get a letter from usually an attorney um, representing that person in a, um, usually a, as a victim in a, in a criminal matter, and uh, they will have these forms from the federal government, and I have to research their um, involvement as a victim or a witness, and simply certify that, you know, this person is a victim um, or a witness, and I send the form back and it goes to the federal government. It's a, for me, it was never a, it was just kind of a process thing, but um, it's good to have it in writing so that everybody in the department is aware of it and knows the process, because maybe I was the only one that knew it, because I was the only one receiving the correspondence. Um, so things like that, and, and a lot of language with some new detainers that were, um, I guess, newer from 2013 that were put out that weren't in our order, just so our officers are aware of the language. And just to be clear about the detainer issue, um, our orders delineates between judicially issued warrants and 
detainers issued by an immigration officer. Um, the warrants are judicially bound, binding. We have to enforce them. Um, we are, by the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution, the state of New Jersey, we can't arrest somebody on a detainer issued by an officer. So that's very important. It was a very, in my opinion, it was a very high liability issue for us. So we just kind of cleared some of that language up about the new detainers and things like that so that everybody is aware of it. And then, so in, in addition to refreshing the language you'll pr in promulgating the updated order, you're going to redo a training or remind us what you're going to do for the staff? Yes. So um, I've, I've actually had a couple um, ideas on that. I think we're going to do a one large training and we're going to actually uh, video it so that we can um, continue to show it through our policy management system. We can put it out and everybody can kind of saves on overtime as well and the people get, you know, we get, we get the, um, the whole department and they can go back to it and look at it. So that, that'll be, uh, that's our idea. Thank you. Ms. Beller? Um, yes, two things. One is, um, uh, this is great, I think the new edition is, I I'm curious what your gut feeling is as you look at these numbers, how you feel about how this turned out. I mean, some of them look pretty comparable to our demographics and some of them aren't, but the numbers are so small. Yeah. So that's a great question. So the first thing to remember, it's always a, this is always the challenge. Um, the quite honest truth is, well, excuse me, comparing these stats to the demographics of the town is always the problem because the, the group, if you will, that we're doing maybe pedestrian stops with or searches on, if I broke them out by address, I'd probably say over 80% of them are not Princeton residents. They are visitors or they're, that's the way it breaks out. Um, so to compare it to our demographics is always a, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, there, there are no, um, as the, our risk assessment committee showed, there were no trends or issues. Um, the numbers are, are small and that's, an issue because if you only have two incidents, that's 50% if, if you have one. And um, yeah, that, that's the biggest, I think the biggest issue are, are the numbers and, and that could be misleading. So we have to, the other issue I should bring up too is that a lot of these things you have to remember are not uh, discretionary actions. So there, a lot of times our officers are called there. So they're called to a uh, shoplifting or whatever and they make an arrest and that counts as a arrest and all that demographic information. There's no discretion in that or they're called to a domestic violence incident and there's no discretion in that. So we have to count that or take that into consideration. What we're really, really zeroing in on are discretionary acts, um, motor vehicle stops, pedestrian stops and um, probable cause searches without arrest, exceptions to the search warrant requirement. We'll look, we look at those and that's why they get meaningful reviews automatically because there's discretion there and that's where you would, you know, uh, theoretically find um, issues if there were, if there were any. Is, is this the sort of information you're going to work with the people at Rutgers on? This is, this is the, this is where it came from. This okay. is their, um, we applied it to these areas and developed it internally based on their um, methods, uh, methodology, if you will, that they used used with us. So we, we took this from them um, and kind of applied it to these different areas that that we're looking at. And this is really a um, this is not a this is dynamic. So as this this risk is, we're always looking for things to to look at. Um, it's not it's this, and it will grow from this as we. But we're trying to get as as I've said in here before, more analytical than just reporting numbers and Mr. DeShield and I have talked about this early in the year that was one of our goals this year was to look behind the numbers and not just at the numbers you, you throw these numbers out and it's very difficult they don't mean anything um, and we're trying to really apply some meaning to them well I want to congratulate you on putting the numbers out because that earlier was it earlier this year or earlier last year time flies but that was we, we did come under some criticism but I think you're being very transparent and particularly when um, you don't necessarily have all the backup that you might like. It's kind of bold to put the numbers out here. Um, it appears that 
women are better drivers than men. I'm happy to see that. Um, but the um, actually detective overtime and the uh, dispatch overtime are relatively high. I wonder if there's. We are, um, yes, the detective overtime is always, that's purely incident driven. That's all overtime where we have to call somebody in um, because it's the middle of the night where there's not a, maybe a detective on or there's a case that runs over that the detective has to keep working and has to work overtime. That's, so that really drives that. Dispatch, we, we are short um, uh, officers, if you will, in there, and we're um, doing our best to try to work people in there and, and cover those shortages. So, um, but that was a, um, an issue we anticipated there because of personnel. Sure. Yeah, Mr. Quinn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you for uh, the department's efforts today. It was a great event and largely because uh, the, the sponsors don't know anything about crowd control and fortunately <laughs> the police officers do. Um, my question in, is in the juvenile report about the, the two girls who ran away from home. If you could just give me an idea of what the department's involvement is and um, do you reach out to other departments to try to find the girls and and or any kid who runs away it's not just girls who run away um, and what's the department's role both um, during finding them and afterward absolutely so um that's a great question it's it's purely a um, what we call juvenile uh, crisis matter so normally we're most of the time we've been lucky enough to be able to track them down locally so we'll go talk to um, parents whoever it may be that reported them missing find out habits things like that and usually it's a you know it's a family matter and we are able to get the the juvenile back and then we intervene with um, recommendations for counseling if if the juvenile needs immediate intervention will will help with that medically um, but that's our role is to bring that family back together in in some cases um, where it gets to a point where the juvenile goes missing maybe uh, as, as a runaway um, they will be entered into the National Crime Information Center as, and any vehicle that's associated with them so if a plate gets run uh, that they may be driving or known to be in um, that, that'll help us find them and usually um, they're likely to get have law enforcement contact somewhere else and as soon as that happens and their name is entered it comes back a hit from Princeton that they're endangered it, it, again it's endangered it's not criminally and then um, we take the actions to get them back and provide follow-up so in all uh, crisis matters like that we really are um, I mentioned it earlier to our, our new recruits it's we're counselors and we're try to solve it at our level but when it gets more serious we obviously bring in different medical and psychological entities that help that sure yeah um chief thank you so much um i know um mr miller uh, councilman miller and myself <clears throat> have been noticing a lot of um i would say mental uh, health issues with several people and several in princeton maybe meeting five or six or that we've been noticing um, things such as um, homelessness um, uh, talking to themselves talking to trees uh, one person I mentioned was on a phone for 45 minutes and no one was on the other end I mean I, I don't know if this is more now or if it's less but is there any I don't really like these word threat but is there any thing that we should be cognizant or should we let please know or I have to say your observations to me are, ac are very accurate. Um, I can't put a necessarily a reason to it. We are um, definitely experiencing a rise in mental crisis calls. Um, today we had three. Yeah. Just today alone. Yeah. And it's something. Um, uh, some of it is substance abuse related. Some of it is not. Um, but we. I have to say we have a great relationship with um, crisis intervention from um, Capital Health and they are um, in our community 
and responding to scenes and getting these people um, getting help. It's a uh, it's one. It, it tends to be at times a revolving a, a cycle where um, we get people help and they're they're treated and then it several days later and that's the sad part. It's much like addiction where it's that you're dealing with that revolving door where they're getting help coming out and maybe not complying and it, it happens again with the same individual. So uh, it, it absolutely, I, I have to say that we're seeing a, um, an increase in those types of calls. It's, and it, they're very difficult to deal with, very, very difficult for our officers to, because um, really it, it's, it's not a criminal issue obviously and sometimes they're engaged in activity can be perceived like that but it's, uh, they're not aware of, of what they're doing and it's, it's tough to um, get through and, and talk um, and, and reason with, with them at times. And some, they can be violent at times. We have had those uh, recently. A lot of our, I, I said this last month, a lot of our use of force, I think over, we had nine, I wanna say like seven are all um, mental health related. Chief, what actions would you suggest or action would you suggest a member of the public take if uh, they see someone who is perhaps obviously homeless. Um, being homeless, I don't think is a violation of the law, but uh, if you see somebody who's got what looks like their possessions, all their possessions in a shopping basket in, in or around a bus stop, for example, or if you see somebody who, who uh, as my colleague, Mr. Liverman pointed out, might be slightly disturbed or just not right. What, what would you suggest that the member of the public do in that instance? So definitely with someone in, in a, a crisis, we had it today over um, the incident, one of the incidents by the library and somebody called. You know, they're usually driven by phone calls from the public that the public notices somebody in, in crisis and calls us. So that's the first thing. You know, I wouldn't really approach um, anyone like that. You, you call 911 we'll be there with and get medical help. We'll bring all the help with us. Um, homelessness is uh, an issue that we've been dealing with. You know, uh, thankfully it's, it's less here than in other places, but it still is here. The, the, there's two issues with that. One is the perception often is when people don't wanna maybe call the police because it, as you say, it's not a crime. And the perception is that we're gonna take some enforcement action and we're not. We're gonna go and talk to the person um, try to get them in touch with resources, provide them information, try to get them to a shelter. We'll drive them. Um, compliance isn't always there, but we're just looking to give resources and help. So I would recommend, you know, it, for um, someone that is concerned, and, and there could be medical issues as well that the person's having that may need help. So I, I would just suggest calling the police, we'll go. Um, there's no law against it. There'll be no enforcement. We'll talk to the person and, and at least get them information. Oftentimes, though, it's, it's very difficult to get um, compliance. Thank you. Um, I had a follow-up question to the beginning part of your report about the traffic enforcement. I know when you were doing this campaign, maybe last year or the year before, you would announce on Facebook we're gonna be on Mercer um, and explain that yes. it's not punitive, it's for um, changing behavior. Yeah. Did you find that was useful? Are you gonna try that again? We or? did find it's useful. Part of the, and we've, we've talked about it internally, part of the issues are um, officers are doing this as part of their daily routine. So if we're going to a specific area, we can do it. But often officers will get a list in the morning of 10 streets that we've gotten, the top 10 complaints in, in town. And throughout the day, they'll go just as a part of their duties to those streets, so it's not a formal, uh, but we're trying to come up with a system where they get it to our social media people and they put it out. So I we didn't forget about it, it's just coming up with a system to get it done on an individual basis. Yeah, it might even work better if you had 40 streets on the list. We're be. gonna be out yeah, on these, these 40 streets, streets exactly. today. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone's gonna exactly. slow down. I agree. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for the chief? Thank yeah, thank you so much. Sure. I just <clears throat> wanted to reiterate what Mr. Quinn said. Um, 
First of all, thank the library um, and also thank the police for today's event. Absolutely. I think it was a surprise community like yeah, event totally. um, that instead of having months of planning, it had about, um, I don't know, <laughs> 15 minutes of where did all these people come from. But it was, it was a great collaboration and um, it, I think the police being there really helped to um, uh, calm people down and at the end people were sharing their glasses yeah. and it was yeah. just a really wonderful yes. coming out to have fun with science so yes. it was a really great day thank you awesome. thanks okay um, and then our next report is the best practices inventory and I'd like to invite up Sandy Webb <laughs> yeah, the hot seat. Congratulations on your A+. Plus. Thank you. It's very exciting. So here we are again this year. This is the eighth year that we've uh, brought this inventory before council, one of the requirements of the state. And a lot of the things that they mention in this is for us to promote um, to promote financial accountability, sound management, and transparency. And that's one of the things the division is pushing a lot of the municipalities towards as part of this inventory. So this year, uh, they actually reduced the number of questions. The questions were down by five, down to 25 this year. And I can go through some of them. I actually wanted to hit on just a couple of them because we are, as you can see from the report, at 100%, so I'm just thrilled with that, that we don't have, you know, we're not going to lose any of our state aid because that's ultimately what happens with this inventory is that it's based on your number of yes answers or your not applicable answers. And if you have less than four no answers on these 25 questions, then you'll lose a portion of your state aid. So I'm really glad that that's not our case. Um, but just a couple of things that I did want to just point out. Um, the, one of the questions here talks about having the, um, uh, before the governing body, your authorities. So that would be the Housing Authority and Stony Brook. And if you remember last year, we had them before us back in October. So we're still within the one year time frame, but I, um, Liz, I think I may have emailed you and said, kind of keep it on your radar. You want to have them back again so that if this question is in, in the inventory again next year, we'll be able to answer affirmative to that. Um, as far as the audit goes, the audit was filed timely. We didn't have any recommendations this year. So I think we're, you know, we're moving along and we're, you know, the, being the fifth year of consolidation, I feel financially that we're in really, really good shape. I think we're, we've got, gotten through all the obstacles of combining our softwares and combining our general ledgers. So I think we're just gonna keep on moving along in that direction. Uh, another one of the questions talks about the budget, whether we met the statutory dates and the dates were extended. And I think Mark and I were talking about this today that in 2017, this was one of the smoothest budgets. We were done early, we were done the beginning of April. So with council's help and with the help of CFAT, we're really you know, moving some of these processes along. Um, based on the recommendation of administration and then the um, action the council took, we've eliminated sick leave, we've eliminated longevity. So these are all the things that the best practices inventory hits on. So at 100%, there's not much more that we can do better. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. Any questions? Ms. Butler? Did you want to go? No. Um, I, I had one question that actually, you, you mentioned the budget and um, doubling back to the last uh, topic the chief covered about the um, mental health issues, the increase, and um, I'm just wondering whether we ought to be thinking about additional funding to deal with that issue for next year and whether that's being discussed. I mean, do, do you think you'll need additional funding to deal with that or how does capital health? Thank you. Um, from a police department perspective, um, we are receiving training now from the county. Um, we're uh, all undergoing that training. We undergo it yearly. So that's really not an expense. Training would be the biggest issue. The only thing 
um, which I can't really speak to, is we work with, you know, Corner House a lot with these issues. Um, so I don't know, I can't really speak to that, but that's the one area that I could come up with. That yeah. And I know at this point we've just started the process. Departments are putting together their budgets. I haven't heard of anything at this point, but we haven't received all the information yet. Thanks. Can I ask you a question, Sandy? Um, the, we're going to have a resolution for a settlement with Avalon Bay over the escrow account. And so, if you don't mind, while we're kind of, it, it's kind of related because Avalon Bay, um, part of this issue, they felt they weren't notified in appropriately of those Whitman bills. Um, and he, uh, Mr. Liddell, raised the issue that he was surprised our auditor didn't have a problem with the way we manage that. And I'm, I know, according to Mark, we've changed some of our practices related to the way we handle those bills as a result of this issue. I'm just wondering if you can explain what we've done to, so we don't, there's never any question, even though we don't think that we, we think we were doing it properly anyway, so we don't run into this again. Well, in terms of the bills that we did receive from Whitman, related to the Avalon Bay. We were satisfied in finance, as were the auditors, that the backup that was supplied was more than sufficient. It was an invoice that showed, I mean, we're not necessarily looking at every single day that a contractor's out in the field and how many hours per day that they're doing that. I mean, I, I think that that, that was something that I think Bob Kaiser was watching. Um, so as far as our auditors and the billing that we paid, we were more than, I was satisfied as the CFO and our auditors were satisfied as well. If I could, one comment. Um, the one big issue was not, not a finance issue. It really was the vendor ensuring that the vendor is actually sending the invoices directly to um, the applicants. And, and that's really the big change. In, and in that's one of the requirements under uh, the land use is that any professionals that we use, you know, be it Mason, be it Whitman, they are by law required to send those invoices to not only to us for payment but also to the applicant and, and i have to i would be remiss if i did not mention in the case of avalon bay we go over and above what we send them more than we do with any other applicant because one of the people in my office has a good working relationship with one of the women in ron liddell's office and and so she makes sure that we not only will not provide, will not give them an invoice that we also do not provide them with backup on because we know how they scrutinize everything and they go through everything. And that's not a bad thing. But so I know that on, on our end, we're going over and above what we do and what we provide to them versus any other applicant as well. So, you know, we felt that we were giving them everything along the way that they were, that they, whatever they were getting billed for in their escrows. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Sandy? Okay. Thank you very much. Fine job. Yeah, I feel like we haven't gotten 100% <laughs> before. I don't think we have. Before, no. So. Thank you. Yeah. We've got 100% on uh, the best practices and a clean audit, so I do have to give kudos to uh, Sandy and the finance office. <laughs> Great job. Um, all right, we'll continue with reports with council. Ms. Howard, any reports? Mr. Liverman? Mr. Miller? I'm pleased uh, to be able to report this evening that Princeton is the recipient of a $30,000 grant from New Jersey Forestry Service. Uh, this is a grant for reforestation and replanting and uh, particularly applicable to uh, the emerald ash borer loss of trees as a result of the emerald ash borer reef forest, uh, infestation. Um, I'd like to compliment our arborist, Rain Konopaka, uh, Janice Most, Bob Huff, and our Shade Tree Commission, all of whom worked together to make this grant happen. It's an unusual kind of grant. We collect the $30,000 after we replant the trees and after we sustain them in place for a couple of years. But uh, it is better than not getting a grant. So 
we look forward to the opportunity to do some replanting with assistance from the State Forestry Service. Thank you. Ms. Kremler, any reports? Ms. Butler? Can I just ask Bernie a quick question? Was that 30000 just based on um, what was available to us, or was it based on did, did we outline specific need for $30,000 worth of trees? Or was the $30,000 it... $30, is the maximum grant amount. Ah, okay. And is there a time limit on that that you know? I mean, it sounds like we're not. We uh, no, the time, the time limit is that we can begin work replanting this fall, but we have to complete the work, I believe, within a year, and then have to uh, monitor and sustain the health of the trees for a couple of years after they're planted. And have we seen a lot of um, ash trees come, that have come down yet? Have we taken a lot down? I don't have the numbers at this point. Okay. Uh, I know there were some sure. that were taken down, not necessarily because they were ash, but because of, um, was it um, PSE&G who was doing some work on one of the roads? There, there was a project where they came in and they took down quite a few trees and it happened to be that, I don't know, 40% of them or so or ash was it the cherry yeah, valley cherry, i think it was on cherry valley road cherry valley road was it Correct. that project that, yeah. that was cherry valley yes right um and the, and i don't know if those were all going to be trees that we would have replaced but I, I know there were, were a significant amount there that were taken down thank you um i was just going to report that the community park pool we've had about um almost 97,000 visitors so far this year. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be over 100, um, but I, I doubt that we'll break a record unless we have absolutely perfect weather between now and the end of the year. Um, I've already mentioned that it will be open on September 9th and 10th. We had the Aquathon over the weekend, and that was great. It was a beautiful day and attended by um, a good number of kids and families. Um, camp program concluded included 23 weeks of total uh, camp with over 600 kids participating so that was also very successful knock on wood um, and then um, I think I mentioned that we were did new lifeguard certification and we were able to train 18 new lifeguards some of which we've hired um, for next year which is great and um, just a little fun fact, since May 1, um, REC has had the, the full-time uh, staffers through REC, the non-OT overtime eligible, have worked 508 extra hours. That's the equivalent of 73 days. That is, gets, that's ours. That's a big benefit to the town. And that's question yes uh, I know that there was some concern about operating the pool through the eclipse uh, and you that uh, the rec department put out very detailed instructions to the staff uh, what happened during the eclipse anything mother nature helped us out by creating some cloud cover and so really it wasn't it, it wasn't it turned out not to be much of an issue at the pool so um, we really got lucky so somebody will have to put that in their tickler file for the next time we have an eclipse because we weren't we you know we just started thinking about it a little bit late i don't know whether we would have gotten glasses for everyone at the pool but there was really no way we could also close the pool and get people out you, you know you wouldn't want to send little kids on their way home you know at least they had some supervision within the pool structure so um i think we we just got lucky with the weather our president was looking directly at the sun, I saw. He was. So hopefully no children followed suit. <laughs> uh, Mr. Quinn? Uh, no reports, ma'am. Right. Sorry, that was a little bit of a cheap shot on my part. Um, couldn't resist. Uh, I had a couple reports. Um, the first is um, the website, and um, when we get to staff reports, I don't know if Mr. Grosser wants to add more to this, but. Uh, the new website 
contract is on the agenda for tonight, and um, everybody who's on the working group, including Ms. Crummeller and Mr. Quinn, are really excited um, about the group that's coming in. Um, they're gung ho. They're going to be meeting with um, a bunch of the different department heads, getting the pages up and running, and they have a pretty um, ambitious timeline. So we'll see. Um, but if we stick to even close to it, um, I think we're, we're going to be really pleased with a new website um, in not too many months' time. Um, the other report, um, I've spoken to some of you, but maybe not everybody yet. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies has a contest every year, um, and they move it around the world. So in 2017, it's for U.S. cities can compete. And for the first time, I think Princeton qualifies, um, I think in part because According to the census, we're just over 30,000 residents, and Bloomberg has lowered um, their qualifying numbers. So you have to have at least 30,000 residents, and Princeton has 30,000, uh, 100, or 23, right? 30,000. So we just make it, um, but that's good enough, and it's a really exciting contest. So what they um, ask each city to do or town to do is think about um, a big urgent problem that we're facing, come up with a solution that's innovative, that can be done not just here in Princeton, but can be replicated in other towns. Um, and if, uh, if we become one of the finalists, there's 35 finalists, and each of those finalists are given $100,000 to pilot their idea. And then of those 35, there's one grand prize winner that wins $5 million. And the four runners up each win $1 million each. So um, that's quite a significant amount of money. Um, and even the process itself can be, uh, I think, an exciting thing for the community. There is a bit of a tight timeline. So um, it's due on October 20th, 2017. Um, with the idea, um, and uh, I sent in an email saying that we'd be interested. Um, they do have a program um, where I, I haven't heard back yet if we're going to be chosen or not, but they'll send a facilitator to do a um, ideas workshop with us in September. Um, and I would just say in the meantime, everybody here, including everybody, uh, members of the public, to um, start thinking of ideas. And you can go, I encourage everybody to go to the Bloomberg Philanthropies website too, if you look up Mayor's Challenge, and you can see um, some of the past cities that have won and some of the past ideas that have won um, to, get you, to give you a sense of um, the kind of projects that they're choosing. Mayor, I would really think that given what um, Michael Bloomberg has expressed interest in the past, we would really want it, our public health um, to think about issues and also the police. Um, I, I don't have a specific idea, but I would really hope public safety and health, the Health Commission could take it up. Definitely. Does he care about deer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think if you if you look at the past um, if you look at the past winners, there's also sustainability, environmental um, projects that have won, um, and we might want to do a collaboration with the school district as well. So there's um, other projects that have won about um, uh, reducing the opportunity gap or achievement gap, um, and. That might be something that we can think of how the town would work together with the schools on that. But there's, um, I think there's a lot of ideas. There's a uh, Barcelona one for a project they did um, with seniors and creating a network, a social network for seniors to engage them more in the community. So it runs the gamut. But I think you're right. Um, there are quite a few of the um, winners have to do sort of overall with wellness and health. And that might be an avenue that um, we could do something innovative here and, and pretty cool. So, uh, 
Are there any staff reports? No? Okay. Um, in that case, we will move on to our public hearings for this oh, evening. I'm, I'm sorry. There was one thing. I mean, um, the police commissioner mentioned that um, Councilwoman Howard. But I just want to thank the police for um, the honoring of uh, Patrolman Billy Ellis uh, over this. Yes, I, I think that that was very, very, um, it was warm, it was moving, and it let his family know that we haven't forgotten that he lost his life here um, in Princeton, trying to save, I believe, two children that were drowning in Carnegie Lake, ended up losing his own life. So we had a memorial service, the police did, um, and I think this Saturday morning, and his family, they were there, and just the kind words that were said about him uh, meant so much. So I didn't want to forget that. I'm thank glad you. you raised that, Lance, too, and that I thank you. Chief is still here, right? That I think this is now going to be a yearly thing, right, where we get to get to recognize two officers who perished um, while in the line of duty. And so I, I think it's, it's appropriate today as we usher in sort of the new generation of the department to reflect on what it means to be in the Princeton Police Department. And I was struck by Chief, your comment always that um, that your officers are guardians, not warriors. Yeah. And Officer Ellis raced to, to try and save these two kids when he was off duty um, and and perished in trying to save them. So um, I, I, th I think it was it was it was a lovely ceremony and it was so great that his family is local and could come. And I think it's great that the officers are committed to every year being able to commemorate that. Yeah. I would echo that too. I know but Ms. Butler was there too. It was a very moving ceremony and I think it um, it just spoke to the fact that it's they are those families are part of the police community and um, it's it's nice to meet the family too, that they're not just monuments out there, that um, there's families still in you know, part of our community and um, that made the ultimate sacrifice and that we're really grateful for them and still want them to feel a part of Princeton. So thank you. Um, okay. Um, we now come to our ordinance public hearings. And the first one is 2017-50, an ordinance by Princeton creating a no stopping or standing zone on the south side of Paul Robeson Place between Chamber Street and Witherspoon Street and amending the code of the borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974. Um, we spoke about this at introduction, but um, this came in response to some safety concerns. So um, with that, I'd like to open up the public hearing for this ordinance. And seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and ask if there's a motion to approve. Second. Um, moved by Ms. Crummeler, seconded by Mr. Quinn. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Howard? Yes. yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Crummeller? Yes. Ms. Butler? Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. And the ordinance passes unanimously. The next ordinance is 2017-46, an ordinance revising the code of the print revising the code of Princeton regarding residential clusters and amending the code of the Township of Princeton, New Jersey, 1968. And um, I'd like to invite up uh, Mr. Solo uh, just to um, go through one more time for council and for members of the public, the ordinance in front of us tonight. We'll open up the public hearing um, and then we'll bring it back to council for a final discussion. Thank you and good evening. Um, as you may recall, this ordinance was introduced back on June 26. It's an amendment to the residential cluster section of Princeton's land use code. Um, the planning board reviewed the ordinance on June 29th and found it consistent with the master plan as well. The ordinance has been subject of a lot of drafts. It's been in front of you for a couple of years now. Um, and with what was introduced, we, we think we have a fairly well-balanced ordinance. I should remind you that the purpose of clustering, because that's what we're doing, we're amending the cluster ordinance, is to allow the most developable area of a site to be more intensely developed in return for preserving open space or preserving the most environmentally sensitive portions of the site. The cluster ordinance has been in place for over 30 years and it's been amended from time to time. Um, first, it was amended to encourage preserving more than 50% of the site and then it was amended to allow access to that open space um, as well. Um, 
The existing cluster ordinance provides a density bonus um, when a developer dedicates walking paths through the open space, um, whether when he preserves more than 50% of the site, and when he provides an active recreation site of at least a half an acre. And they can receive currently under the ordinance up to a 35% bonus if they were to total up all the bonuses, and, and then there's a cap. Um, the amendment before you tonight adds a new category, and that's a density bonus for dedicating suitable land for affordable housing. And what we're looking for as we deal with our affordable housing obligation and realizing that it's going to be continuing, whether it's this next round which goes through 2025 or another round that'll go through 2030 and beyond, we need to think ahead and decide how could we meet that need. And this ordinance allows us to do that by getting land and then you'll see in the ordinance, it doesn't say what will happen on the land. We're almost banking it so that we can come back to it um, when we need it and then craft zoning that would um, indicate what's there. We have put in some, some caveats though, um, that the land that's being offered for dedication and for affordable housing must be in a sewer, in a sewer service area or have sewer service. It should have frontage on an existing or a proposed road um, no more than 20% of the site can be in steep slopes, wetlands, or flood hazard areas, and it needs to be free of any environmental hazards. So we're trying to build in something that says if we get the land, is it suitable for development? Can it be developed in the future? Um, and we believe this provides at least a, a, a minimum assurance that it can be. In order for a developer, though, to be eligible for the affordable housing bonus, we've put in some additional requirements. Currently, the ordinance only requires either a six or an eight acre parcel to do clustering. Um, and we thought with the affordable housing, it needed to be a larger site, so we're requiring 75 acres. We also are requiring right out the gate that 70% of the track be open space. You'll remember I had indicated before it was only 50%. And we've bumped up the um, setback for the cluster development itself. Under the current ordinance, it has to be set back 40 feet around its perimeter. If they're doing or taking advantage of the affordable housing cluster, it has to go to 100 feet around the entire perimeter of, of the site. Um, the applicant can receive up to a 30% um, density bonus for the affordable housing. However, we've placed a cap of 50% um, on any of the bonuses. So even if they were eligible for the 35% of the open space and the 30% um, for the affordable housing, we're, we're capping it at, at 50% um, of the total. Um, that uh, affordable housing bonus works that for every one acre of land dedicated to the municipality, in excess of one acre, the developer receives a 15% bonus. So it's a sliding scale depending on the acreage. Um, but we set it at an acre so that we get at least a minimum um, of an acre, which is, we believe, something that we could then do something meaningful with in terms of affordable housing. That's a real brief summary of the ordinance. There are a couple of other little technical amendments you'll see. We've changed township to municipality and corrected some of the other language, but that's really um, the guts. I don't know if council has questions or mayor, if you just want to open it up to the public. I know we do have some people here. Well, let's say if there's questions, clarifying questions, let's start with those. Ms. Butler. I do have a question. Um, the previous ordinance, um, it, set a cap at 35 percent uh, for the developer if for multiple bonuses and i'm wondering why we would want to raise it to 50 percent um primarily because we're adding this new category it's an additional 15 percent we didn't really believe in talking with a developer that we would get um, the affordable housing would would be attractive enough without going that high um, if it was set at 35 percent, th there's no additional bonus um, for them to give us um, or dedicate the land. And that was really the, the, the real reason was to make it more attractive in talking with a, a developer that for them to give up the land as well as the open space and all the other things, the public access to the via trails. You know, I guess I have a concern that when we're talking about properties that might fall into this category, we're talking about substantial acreage, and in 
then you have to wonder whether that is in keeping with what we were talking about, where we would want affordable housing if we're looking at smart growth. Um, you know, we're always happy to have affordable housing, but this might not have been our first choice. It's pretty far out that, it, that you know, on 206 there is a bus line, but it's not near, you know, it's more near, frankly, Montgomery services than it is ours. Um, so, I, I, I don't know, I have a little, little bit of a question about that. And in reading the report from PEC, it sounds as if they're somewhat skeptical uh, and maybe I was reading into it, but um, they're skeptical that if all the um, setbacks are met, including the New Jersey DEP, I guess, for all the um, water and whatnot, um, that you might not really be able to fit 30 units there. I mean, it, it, are we confident that we can get 30 units there? And I, I, if we can't get 30 units, then then what happens? Um, yeah, the reason I'm hesitant, we, we have a concept and we believe the concept works out. Part of this process will be going to the planning board. The way our cluster ordinance is structured and it would work whether there's an affordable housing component or not, a developer has to submit what we call an as of right plan. He has to show us a subdivision that complies with the zoning. It has the right lot area, it has the setbacks, and it shows that it has a reasonable, what we call building envelope, a place to put a house. Uh, if they can't do that, um, or if they can't maximize their yield based on that analysis, they're gonna get less units. Um, this ordinance doesn't presuppose, I, I know we've been focusing on, on one parcel, that that developer is gonna get 30 units. If he's able to maximize um, the bonus potentials, that's what he's gonna get. If when we do the detail, more detailed analysis of the as of right plan, and instead of getting 20, he only gets 18, that becomes the base density that we then move forward with. Looking at a concept layout, we think, and he thinks he's gonna get 30, but again, we haven't done that kind of detailed analysis um, because it's not before you as a subdivision or site plan. That'll come later in front of the planning board. Ms. Cromwell. Um, in your memo, you mentioned that there are I think you think we. I think there's one other tract or two that are not university owned. Um, staff identified one other non-institutional owned site where where this could occur. It's a two-acre zoning site. Um, you know, and and again, it's if you're thinking forward to to grab some sites, these larger sites are the place where you can get additional land for affordable housing. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail because there's no application pending. Yeah. I haven't met with anybody to talk about it. It's just in our due diligence of the site, we said where else could this occur? I mean, the 75 acre didn't magically appear. We, we talked about whether it could be 25 or 20 or 50 and felt comfortable with the 75 because it would only occur one other place other than some of the institutions which currently have, have zoning that allow them to do quite a bit. Well, my question was, why it, does that mean that the institutionally owned properties wouldn't be affected by this? It's hard to say. I mean, if, when you start playing what-if games, if an institution said, even though I have a building and I can assemble, you know, the 75 acres, would I want to do this? Well, I'm um, just wondering that caveat in, in the memo. Well, well, candidly, the University of Springdale Golf Course if they were to come in, they could say a cluster, but under the E zone, they could probably do just as well or better than as, as opposed to the cluster ordinance. Are there any other questions before you open up the public hearing? Okay, we'll come back to council after the public hearing. So with that, I'd like to open up the public hearing and I'd invite anybody who'd like to speak on this ordinance to come up to the microphone State your name and address. Get close to the mic, but not too close. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to read something into the public record. I... So 
My name is uh, Stephen Jarden, and, and I live on Herontown Lane, and I'm really speaking on behalf of uh, 18 residents on Herontown Lane, that we formed a, a Herontown Lane uh, Association. And, and I have a statement that I'd like to read. <clears throat> We as the Herontown Lane Association homeowners and as individuals object to the proposed ordinance. Our attorney, uh, Bruce Afrin, is un unable to be here tonight due to a uh, personal family uh, commitment, but we're making his statement of our objection to the proposed ordinance. It's clear to us from the manner in which it what has originated and been presented by the planner to council that it is intended to enable specific spot zoning for the benefit of one landowner, the owner of the landwind tract, and that the other potential sites or, or site, it's really included in the ordinance solely to give the ordinance some legal cover against a claim of spot zoning. The ordinance improperly frees the owner of the site of the duty to seek a variance to gain an increase in the number of units for the site. In addition, the calculation that has been presented of 24 acre plots under the existing zoning that is being used to support the ordinance is incorrect, as most of the site is unbuildable under existing zoning and DEP regulations, and that at most five to nine lots could be constructed as of right under the existing rules and laws. Further, this proposed ordinance, by encouraging construction on this site and increasing the number of units available for the landman track, is inconsistent with the master plan that specifically called for this entire site to be placed into preservation, not merely a part of the site. Further, the owner of the site is illegally purchasing this ordinance by offering in exchange for the approval to give a designated parcel of land to the municipality for affordable housing. For these reasons and others that our council has previously set forth to, to this council and stated to the planning board, we object to the approval of this ordinance. And I, I, I have the list of the 18 uh, members of our association that have approved this uh, statement. Okay, thank you. Kathy, do you have a copy of the whole thing with the names? Okay, we'll make sure that goes into the minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Hi, I'm Valerie Haynes on Mount Lucas Road. Um, I come at this from a totally different perspective. First of all, I think that to uh, provide in the cluster ordinance that a developer can get a bonus for providing some additional property that will be dedicated to affordable housing is perfectly appropriate. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, we give bonuses in the ordinance now for recreational sites and for the uh, paths and trails that Mr. Solo mentioned. So we need affordable housing. We ha are committed to it in our master plan and in our ordinances. It's one of our primary goals. Um, the concern I have is that in the initial letter requesting that the council consider an ordinance amendment, which came from the developer land when the owner, they said that they had spoken with the township staff and that after internally discussing ideas, the municipality was not inclined to an inclusionary development proposal, but was interested in a more modest bonus in exchange for a lot. Uh, they, they proposed that perhaps it was possible to do a significantly higher density and have an inclusionary development that had 15 to 20 percent set aside of affordable units. I don't know if that will work on that site or not, but I don't think anybody else who's sitting here today, except perhaps Mr. Solo, knows whether that will work because it hasn't been discussed. Uh, and I brought it up at the initial meeting of the council a year or so ago when this application first came before you. I've brought it up at the planning board. I brought it up at ZARC. Um, and it just has never been discussed. It's never been explored, at least not in public. And in public is where it needs to be explored. It may be a good idea. It may not be a good idea. But we haven't talked about it. So I think that, you know, when you... When you're zoning a piece of property, whether it be 
uh, or in this case, you're amending an ordinance and imp it impacts a specific piece of property. Um, you need to look at it not only from the perspective of the property owner and what the property owner sees as the best use from his perspective, but also from the town's perspective. And our perspective as a town, according to our public statements, is that we not only want more low and moderate income housing, but we also want more middle income housing. And our master plan, specifically in its strategies section of the housing element, specifically says clusters are a way to achieve more middle income housing, not just to preserve open space. Of course, they do do that, and that's a good thing, but also to get more middle income families. We, we need that. We've, uh, you know, there's, in a substantial discussion throughout the town for many months about the concerns people have. And I, I'm just very frustrated that that conversation has not occurred. So that's where I'm coming from. Totally different perspective. Um, thank you. Thank you. Nat Boddick, i from White Pine Lane, uh, Princeton. Uh, I wanted to echo the, the concerns that Councilwoman Butler raised about the location of the affordable housing. I do agree with, uh, with Valerie Haynes that um, it's appropriate use to, of, of land and an appropriate arrangement with the municipality, um, but it is a concern about its location and the mobility and access to economic and other opportunities that would be available to residents of, of any future development on that site. And so uh, effort would need to be made to make sure that that was a, 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 good, uh, a good location for affordable housing. I also wanted to echo the comments that uh, Ms. Haynes made about uh, middle income housing and, uh, and asking precisely the questions that she asked. And then uh, I, I feel as if, you know, when this ordinance is being considered, that its applicability to, to properties not just as large as Springdale Golf Course, for example, but maybe the Textile Research Institute as well as being a, a location that um, you know should be encompassed in a more general approach to providing middle-income housing, preserving land, making and um, providing amenities for for surrounding communities. Thanks very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak as part of the public hearing? Good evening, Mayor, members of council. My name is Tom Letizia. I'm an attorney with Pepper Hamilton, and I represent Lamwin Development Corp. Lamwin is the owner of a 90-acre site at the uh, near the location of Herontown Road and Mount Lucas Road and it was the, I guess the property that initiated this uh, ordinance amendment some 20 months ago and may be eligible to receive the additional cluster provisions that you're discussing uh, this evening. I've appeared before uh, council before at the the time of introduction back in June. I appeared before the planning board. I, I believe the planning board reviewed this in different capacities, either as the planning board or as ZARC uh, three times and also before ZARC. So this ordinance proposal has been under review for, for some time. And just quickly uh, to give you my client's perspective. What you're being asked to do this evening is to decide a, a policy. That is, do you want to build upon Princeton's residential cluster provisions that have been in effect for decades to encourage preservation of sensitive environmental features, set aside a significant amount of open space, and provide public access uh, to the property in exchange for density bonuses. That has been a policy in this town for a very long time, as Mr. Solo uh, indicated. In fact, Princeton has been was one of the early pioneers of cluster uh, zoning. This ordinance, 
ordinance amendment continues the trend by adding another public goal of encouraging a donation of land for municipal affordable housing and encouraging even more or further clustering, a tighter cluster plan in exchange for a modest increase in density. You're not being asked to decide the suitability of, of a specific plan at a particular site under the ordinance. Such a review, as noted by Mr. Solo, will be conducted by the planning board as part of a subdivision or site plan application. This is not to minimize the concerns that have been raised by the residents of Herontown Lane and, and others during this process. I just want to, to note that those comments and concerns will have a full public airing at, at the appropriate time before the planning board. Tonight, again, is a vote on a policy. Whether you wish to utilize your residential cluster provisions to provide the opportunity for affordable housing and to even provide for a greater amount of open space preservation. And then finally, this is something I've said at, in the different forums. <clears throat> From my client's perspective, this is not a do or die situation. If you will decide this is not something you want to proceed on, that is fine. My client is ready to proceed under its as of right <clears throat> plan under the ordinance and will be ready to defend that before the, uh, the planning board. We think this ordinance amendment makes a lot of sense. Yes, it provides an increase in density for my, for my client, but again, it will present a number of community goals and objectives that you've been uh, grappling with and encouraging throughout your zoning ordinances uh, for, uh, for a very long time. So with that, I hopefully you'll concur and vote to uh, pass the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak as part of the public hearing? Anybody else? Okay, seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public hearing and we'll bring the discussion back to council. Ms. Howard? Actually, is it appropriate for me to ask a question of a fellow council member? Because I wanted to fine. ask, um, Tim, I, I just, um, I, I, I found it a little bit hard to, under, to understand all the arguments in the PEC letter, which interestingly was addressed to you in a previous capacity, I think, right? Um, so could you just comment on where PEC is on this? Because my perspective has been that this is the more environmentally conscious way to develop, and um, but what's PEC's bottom line? I I think again, while while the difficulty that PEC had is the difficulty that everyone has, which is separating out the fact that this is not a site plan, um, that that this is an ordinance about this is a policy decision that we're making. So they have doubts about the as of right plan as it was presented. Um, but again, that's not a site plan. In the end, um, they endorsed clustering as the most, as the plan that made the most environmental sense on this site. Um, and this proposal was also endorsed, notably, although they're not a, they're not a, a BCC for us by, by the Friends of Princeton Open Space and other environmental and open space advocates in town. Uh, and the, the planning board voted that it was consistent with the master plan. Um, and PEC's representative to the planning board voted in favor uh, of the, the vote before the planning board. The, the question before the planning board was whether it was consistent with the master plan. 
PC's representative voted that it was. Um, again, it's, it's difficult for everyone, including council, to separate out, but this is a, this is a policy uh, decision. So if I could take my time now, I, I would say that I'm in favor. I've been on the record. Uh, Ms. Crummiller and I have had, uh, have had collegial disagreement on this. Uh, I think that the concern about the site of the affordable, uh, the potential affordable site is, um, is valid. However, I would note that it's right in between two big affordable housing developments uh, in town. So while we would prefer affordable housing that's consistent with smart growth, I don't think that they're you know, land is at a premium anywhere in the municipality. And um, so for environmental reasons and also for the land uh, and for the open space, I'll, I'll be voting in favor of the ordinance. I, I'd like to comment that uh, I found the discussion up to this point extraordinarily interesting because what's before us is an ordinance that sets a policy and the objections I've heard to the policy pull it back to a specific site. I've heard objections to the development of that site uh, for a long period of time, and those objections do not belong in the discussion of how we develop policy for cluster housing. I also found it interesting that uh, one of the concerns about the site was uh, that the, the ordinance wasn't good enough. Well, separate, I think the job before council is not to deal with a specific site. That will be dealt with when the developer, and if the developer comes forward with a specific plan. The job before council is, is this a good ordinance for cluster development? Does it contain the features that we want for cluster development? If it does, and I believe it does, then we support it. If it doesn't, we don't support it. And then let, let the developer deal with the site-specific issues. That is the developer's problem. And that comes before the planning board. And the, I gather from a comment that was made earlier that he'll be adequately represented if and when that happens. Are there any other um, council members who'd like to weigh in at this point? Ms. Crumler? Yeah, I mean, I won't um, beat a dead horse because I've said this at the planning board and I said it here. Um, but I do, um, just Heather, to answer your question, I think there was some questions on, on PEC. I'm not saying that they were overwhelming, but I think some of the people were um, wondering the same thing that I wonder whether um, a four acre zone is um, better than 30 half acre. I mean, 24 acre houses are better than 30 half acre houses. So, but I don't want to use that in my argument. I'm just letting you know that I think th there were some, qu I mean, I don't, I think the guy on the planning, I mean, is, he, is his name Xenon? Zen I think he w felt a little reservation about this ordinance, but that was just one person. But um, that's my reservation. I feel like I don't want to encourage, I think that the kind of housing that this is encouraging might have been, I think we might have wanted it years ago, but now it's the worst kind of housing. It's going to be beyond, um, it's going to be very expensive, but, um, and, but, and every person's going to have two cars, they're going to drive, it's, it, I, you know, I just, it's going to, they're going to be houses that we're all going to regret when we see them go up. That's what I, that's what I worry about. So I don't want to encourage it. Um, and I think that the, the affordable housing location isn't ideal either. And we don't, I think we have some, I mean, we're, we have, we have our own, the sites that we have maybe might be better like we are doing. We're expanding on sites that we have. So I'm going to vote against this ordinance, but I won't belabor it. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Limerick. Yeah. Um, it's, I agree with um, Councilman uh, Miller 
that we shouldn't be uh, site specific at this point, um, but but policy. But just a note, um, you know, I can back in I guess '76. I'm not sure when Princeton Community um, Village was built. Valley was it '76, late 1976, or, or, or back then. I can imagine people having the same discussion and saying, "Why would you put affordable housing at site?" I remember when Reading Circle was built, and the Yedlin family, um, the same thing there. Why would you put affordable housing there? If you go and ask anyone that lives in those developments, uh, Griggs Farm, anybody lives in those developments, are you happy that you have an affordable housing uh, home at this site? The majority of them say, it's fine. We're glad we're here. So I don't think that because it's not ideal for us means that there's not someone that will love to live in affordable housing on those three acres off 206. I mean, I just hate to say it. A home is a home. And it's better to have a house somewhere than have a house nowhere. So I understand what you're saying, I really do, but I don't think that we should be site specific and, and this detail when it comes to um, the affordable housing site. So I do hear what you're saying. There's better sites, I agree with you, but I do really understand that when you're dealing with affordable housing and someone needs a home, I don't think they're questioning if they have to get fr from um, you know, point A to point B as long as there's a home at that location. Thank I'll you. just pick up on that, that I think that's right. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're having the conversation about where we should be and we should be. Where should affordable housing be? Um, and the majority of the affordable housing that we plan for, we're trying to do in that smart growth way and we're very conscious of transportation and access to jobs and other services. But I think also when it comes to affordable housing, we recognize that our both our obligation but our moral commitment is significant and that we believe every neighborhood should participate and and this is a reflection of that i think that that it really is um that every opportunity we have we should be talking about affordable housing um and so i think this reflects that commitment and so for that reason but also um because although i get that it's 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 not a it's not 100 percent clear but that overall this kind of cluster approach is more environmentally um Conscious, I'm conscious. Um, so, for those reasons, I will support. Lee, this um, affordable housing we would have to develop ourselves, right? The, the developer is not providing any development of this property. Not at, the, at this time. The way the what the ordinance does um, is require, or if they choose to take this option, they dedicate land to the municipality you then have a variety of options. Um, so if somebody, if you're dedicated two or three acres of land, you can rezone it um, so that it becomes a 20% set aside. You can partner as we just the, um, a few weeks ago did with Princeton Community Housing to add additional units at PCV. We could partner with somebody to create 100% affordable. Uh, there are a series of options you could do. I, I know some of the surrounding communities have done things with, um, I think it's community options and doing um, housing, uh, assisted type housing, uh, you know, on, usually they want five acres, um, but, uh, you know, so there are a lot of options, which is why not knowing what our needs are going to be, we're really looking at this as, we're going to have some time to develop. So I think there are options as to how you, you do it. If the developer does come forward and dedicate the land to the municipality, the council then will have the opportunity to work and think about what you want to do. We'll have more hearings on just that. I mean, the surrounding area is fairly low density. However, it is adjacent to Montgomery Township where you're looking at six to eight units an acre. Right, but I, I guess knowing that we have committed to 100% financing with um, Princeton Community Housing, our ability to really develop that might be limited unless we go with a developer. We're not going to be able to do 100% affordable on there. You have likely. options and there's no... I mean, 100% we're f financed by right. us. So I, I just think we need to have a reasonable expectation there that we're not likely to get to that anytime soon right which is why at a staff level we, we didn't want to write an ordinance now because we don't know what our, our obligation will be or our resources will be uh, so this way you have the land it's dedicated for that purpose and you have some time to figure that out right um, I, I guess I would ask my colleagues whether there's any as a policy 
um, any interest in an amendment that um, would not involve, that would go back closer to the original amendment of a 35% um, benefit for multiple, if you meet multiple, um, you know, where, where you would qualify for multiple bumps in your, I think it's on page seven out of 16 of the uh, ordinance at the bottom of the page. If the developer for a, qualifies for a bonus in more than one category, bonuses shall be um, accumulated but shall not exceed, the original said 35%. Um, we're, we're going to increase it to 50%. I, I just Does have anybody a, care about that? Well, I, I have Am a I the process only question yes, about if, that. I think if it so, would be a sub, you're wondering I'm if assuming that's a substantive change, but then would it also go back to the planning board then? Or, is, or would it not need to go back to the planning board? Uh, is your mic on? I don't know. It would be consistent with, it would be taking that change out, so it would be consistent with the current cluster, is that right? I don't, I don't think it would have to go back to the planning board, but I, but it certainly would be a substantive change that you'd have to. We'd have to reintroduce. Right. And then have another public hearing. Well, and I, so I, I just had another quick question, so also, I. I feel like part of the way the math was done for the change was to incentivize the new provisions for the affordable housing. So if it's if it's capped at 35%, then the incentive for the affordable housing goes away essentially. Is that so right? To a larger extent, yes. Okay. That's my question. That's your question too. Okay. Um, well, so I don't know if anybody's I don't know it whether it, does it really go away? Uh, the difference between 35 and 50 percent, does it go away? It, it did in the present case. I mean, we discussed, I mean, the landwood piece has been discussed for a long time. We were, we started at a much higher number than it became somewhere around 50, and now we're down to 30. Um, Mr. Letizzi is here if he cares to respond, but I don't think the developer is interested in less than 30 units. As a policy, you could say it should just be as it currently is at 35 and, and put in the affordable housing. I do have a concern if that's going to be enough in, on the other sites to, to actually have somebody do it, but I, I don't know. Well, I, I know, but I guess that gets back to my earlier concern that we're talking about large sites here and you know how much development do we want to encourage I, on those large sites. And, and we haven't done an analysis on all the sites. Um, the only one in front of us is Lamwin, and we have done that. Under the existing cluster, under existing zoning, they believe they could get 20 lots. Under the existing zoning, they've submitted a plan that they show they can get 27. With this new provision, they would get 30. I would think other sites would have a similar type increase. Um, so it's, you know, in total, it's a 50% increase going from 20 to 30, but the numbers are not large numbers. No, but uh, on another site, they might be. I, I don't know. If nobody cares, nobody cares. But, um, uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge your concern about the discussion um, not having more of it public earlier. I think that that was, we, we probably, um, should have done that and could have done that and um, you know we're now passing this at the end of August when a, more people might have participated except for the timing um, and I agree that I'm not a hundred percent convinced that this is more environmentally um, a, a better choice it's just I'm, I, I just you know if all of a sudden we go from two people two cars on you know, for 20 people or for 20 lots, that's 40 cars up on a country road. We've now got 60 with 30 um, units, and they'll probably have two cars each. So that, that is a significant um, 
increase to me on, and one of the considerations, Valerie, was that it, this really is kind of a country road up there. It's not the same as, um, you know, there are no sidewalks up there, and, um, you know, it, it, it's just different. It has a different feel, and um, so I, I have mixed emotions. I probably am going to support it, but I, I have mixed emotions about it. Is there anybody else who'd like to if we're ready to vote? speak? I just, can I say one more thing sure. that I forgot to say? Um, I also, one of the other reasons I, I don't think that the, if we, if the zoning was kept at 20%, the developer saying they don't really care, but I, I really wonder about that because marketing right now in Princeton is showing that the high end houses like above like 3 million are not selling. And the, I think that these half acre houses are just the sweet spot for developers and that's what's motivating this. And I mean, I, it, it, it's not, I mean, I understand there's a, it, it's not a strong argument because I don't, I, it's not a huge difference, 27, 30, but I just wanna point that out that I feel like the reason that this hasn't been developed under the current ordinances that it's, there's not a strong incentive, a, 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 a strong fi enough financial or even um, possibility for the developer. So that, you know, we're just enabling this to happen. Maybe it wouldn't happen at all if we don't do this. Can I, can I ask one more quick question? Uh, was Bruce Efron at the planning board? And so you heard these arguments, the planning board, when they determined that it was in keeping, that they'd heard all of this. Right, but like I voted in favor of it at the planning board level also because the planning board was just focusing. Oops, I, I voted on f in favor of it at the planning board because the planning board was just focused on whether it consistent. was consistent with the master plan, and I had to admit that it was. I'd like to make a, a motion for me. You may. Um, that we um, accept um, ordinance twenty seventeen dash forty six. And is there a second? So it's been moved by Mr. Liverman and seconded by Mr. Miller. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Ms. Crummiller? No. Ms. Butler? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. And the ordinance passes um, by a vote of five to one. Thank you, everybody who turned out. Madam Mayor? Can we make an adjustment with the resolutions and move up seven, eight, and nine? That's only because Mr. Gregory is here. Definitely. And he's been working so hard with the flyers and gas leaks and so forth. I don't think it's fair to keep him here too much longer if we okay. don't have to. Fair enough. Um, Do you want me to second that motion? Yes. Yeah, so um, Mr. Liverman has made a motion. Do you want to take them in block? 17263, 17264, and 17265. Well, first, yes. he's yes. first he's amending the agenda. Yeah, I was amending oh, the agenda. first you're amending the agenda, amending the agenda to move to. I second okay, it. all right. So um, there's a motion to amend the agenda to move those items um, to next in line. It's been seconded by Ms. Butler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, all right. So now, do you want to make a motion to take those up? I make a motion that we move them a block if we can. Uh, okay. To seven, eight, and nine. That's resolution seventeen two six three seventeen two six four. 17265. And is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Crummiller. And are there any questions about any of these? I have a question. Ms. Butler? Um, yeah, Bob, the, the, some of this equipment, do, do you want to come to the microphone? The, um, I think it's the um, self contained breathing apparatus. Is all of our equipment expiring at once on some of these? And is, I guess that's the there question. Hey, can you hear me? Is this, are we replacing our, yeah, yes, we can. Are so we what, replacing our entire stock of right. this? And what, would we be better off having some of it staggered so we had, or, or, you, or is it better to just replace it all at once? So some of the equipment was purchased on a grant in one lump sum going back a number of years and it's reached the end of life. So unfortunately we have to purchase some things um, to replace them. But the plan going forward, 
um, that Mark and I and the Chiefs have worked out is to actually start staggering things now okay. uh, and replacing them over a number of years instead of getting hit every so many years with one gigantic order. Well, and just so the at least you have some equipment that's right. And the other really piece cool. of it is is the NFPA had made upgrades to the SCBA, the heart, you know, their regulatory agency. And one of the big things that has changed on SCBAs is there's trackers on them now. So you can actually track the firefighters on the fire ground uh, where they're at. Um, so that's a big, that's a big plus bonus. for yeah, firefighter yeah, safety. That's a great, yep. which then you're happy to have all new equipment. Right. Okay. okay. Um, are there any other further questions or comments on these? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, thank the you. Resolutions all three pass. So thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay. <laughs> the last discussion was very interesting. It did. All right. Uh, and then we're going to go back to resolution 17257, resolution providing for the combination of certain issues of general improvement bonds, series 2017 of Princeton and the County of Mercer, New Jersey, into a single issue of bonds, aggregating 24,200,000 in principal amount. And um, since this is uh, such a big, um, yeah, do you want to move it at least? Get on well, the I do. And since we've just heard how great Sandy is, I trust her. To <laughs> but if we, can, we can also listen to her explanation. Okay, so it's been moved by Ms. Kremler. Do you want to second I'll it? Second it. Seconded by Ms. Butler. And um, can you, do, how much are were we expected to save from the, save from this? Well, these, uh, the first resolution is to combine the various re um, bond ordinances. That's what that provides. The second resolution lays out um, the actual debt schedules of what the payback will be. So this is, shouldn't come as a surprise. We had notes that um, we issued in 2015. We added some additional funds to them last year, which brought our notes to 19,500,000. Um, we know that Deanna and Fire and some of the other departments are moving forward with some of the newer ordinances. So we're adding an additional 4.7 million of our existing notes. And so we've come up with the 24,200. Million. Two, I'm sorry, 24 million, 200,000. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Zero. Um, so this is for our bond sale that we're gonna have in September. Uh, we have a bond rating call with one of the rating agencies on Thursday. So this, is, this was part of the plan all along. It goes in conformance with the debt policy that we have. So we're just permanently financing some notes that we have. Okay. Can I ask a question? Some of these um, items that we're financing um, were uh, like, mm, I don't know. There's one that says very, various capital improvements finally adopted in June 2010 but the useful life's eight and a half years, and here it is, 2017. So it's only uh, 17,000. I guess I'm just wondering. Yeah, I, let me talk to a couple of the older ones. So yes, that'd be helpful. The very first one is Tusculum. Um, I know that there was, this was a, a township ordinance that was done for that acquisition of that land. And I know that there were some grants involved. I don't know if whether this was one that we never collected some of the grants that were anticipated. I don't have the history because it was a township ordinance. And so some of the ones that are up in the beginning are former township ones that for whatever reason were never financed. And I really just need to clean them up. The money's been spent. We don't have, we've never issued debt on some of these. So a lot of this is, and, and Mark and I have talked about this. We're gonna continue to clean up you know, if you remember when, when Patrick Simon was on council, he always brought up the annual debt statement that I prepared at the beginning of the year because there's so much that's on there that we have not financed that goes back. You know, this one goes back to 2006. It goes back right. a long time. So we're going to begin to clean up some of the older ones as well. But these, since the money was actually already spent, we felt that, and bond council agreed that it was still in a good time frame for us to issue debt on these. 
Could you explain why, if the money's been spent, it's gone, why we want to finance it now? We borrowed the money from other issues that we had moved forward with, so this is really giving ourselves our money back to move forward with the projects for which we actually borrowed the money for. I, I just have a follow-up question on Tusculum. Why, was, why isn't that coming from the Open Space Fund? It, it may have. I think that there was a big portion of it that did, and I think there was a small portion that was still to be funded as general obligation bonds for, for that one particular, for the Tusculum. Okay. Do you remember that? Any of my older colleagues <laughs> from Township Committee? I shall not tell a lie. I remember the name and how things were arranged, but as far as Yeah, I mean, it was 11 years ago. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I mean, could we, could we decide now to do it from open space instead of from general obligation? I think that the bond council may have a problem with it since we've already advertised this. Okay. And, you know, the, the ad, I think Kath's already placed the ad in the newspaper for the bond sale. And I'm, I'm thinking open space may not even have that much money 11 years ago. I'm sorry? They may not even have that, that much funding 11 years ago. I know we changed how much we contributed. But if we, but this is what we're doing now. Yeah. Right. And if we had the money now, it might be wise, might it not? I mean, maybe Sandy can ask and see. I mean, Sandy, what do you think? I mean, isn't if it were a possibility that we could use open space funds? But it sounds like we've already advertised. Yeah, right. we've already and advertised, and I'd I'd rather leave the open space for any. Future acquisitions. I mean, it, right. We'll, and, we'll and have what plenty we will end up doing when space. we do sell this, I will keep that portion out and and pay for that back out of the open space fund. If Joe, I'm sure you remember that the financial advisor provides us with debt schedules that breaks out what's capital, what is sewer related, what's open space. So when we prepare those budgets, we take that into consideration and charge. The, this open space portion to the open space budget. Okay. Just, we can we can do. That. Okay. I'm sorry. Charge the actual debt service to the open space budget. Right. Yeah, because I believe we also um, got a check from Friends of Princeton Open Space because they received their Green Acres funding which also tends to lag behind. I can't remember if that was for Tusculum or for Coventry. It might have been for Tusculum even. So there might be money in there to start mm -hmm. paying back. Okay. Um, all right, so the first resolution has been moved and seconded. Are there any other questions on this first one before we take a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, passes unanimously. And next 17258, which we've been discussing jointly, which is the resolution determining the form and other details of $24,200,000 general improvement bond series 2017 at Princeton in the County of Mercer, New Jersey, and providing for their sale. Is there a motion to approve? So I'll move to second. Moved by Ms. Butler, seconded by Ms. Crumiller. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, resolution passes unanimously. Next is 17259, resolution authorizing the award of a contract to Zodo. <laughs> Can I get some help with the pronunciation of that? That does that's not better, inspire confidence. I'm than, glad <laughs> I've met with them. That's better than how I pronounce it. Um, we call them Seamless, but that's their overarching company's name. All right. Uh, incorporated DBA Seamless Docs, New York, New York, for the Municipality of Princeton website redesign in the amount not to exceed $55,000 for a five-year contract. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Mr. Quinn, seconded by Mr. Liverman. Can I ask Any a question, question? about yep, this? Ms. Butler. Um, uh, on this website, will various people within the municipality be able to put up content? So I, I'm thinking about REC. Will they be able to put up content themselves? They're not going to have to go th through this company in the way that we've had to do it before? Yeah, yes, that's correct. answer that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, this, this system is actually a CMS system, which stands for Content Management System. Um, it's super easy to use. Uh, the website working group had a couple different companies that showed off how the sites could be updated by staff. And um, 
we've actually spoken to people that are using it right now, and, and they say it's as easy to use after about a half hour, an hour training, people can do it on their own. Um, and we've had staff part of the website working group that have been observing this. Um, the key is having a system that you can update without changing the whole theme of the website, because that's the concern is that, you know, you can get in there and make the site look, your particular department or division look completely different than the theme of the website. So we want to make sure that it's within a structure, which uh, Seamless did a really great job of offering. Um, they also use, uh, they're pretty heavy into analytics, so they decide and determine what sites, what resources are being utilized most frequently, and then they really highlight those items so people can find them easily, um, which was a, another key selling point. Right. One of the complications is that there are some departments and um, boards and commissions that have sites that are not on the regular website, and REC is one of those. So that needs to be an additional conversation um, because some of them, um, it might make sense to keep as separate things. I mean, certainly like we've talked about like the REC sign up system that, um, you know, there's ways to make it look like when you go there, you can, they can use the same sort of framework of the regular website so it doesn't look like you're going somewhere else but that um, it might just stay separate. Um, but then there's other pieces of it too where it might make sense to bring it in. Um, and there's other examples. Too, I mean, the website company, uh, Seamless Gov, is also Seamless Docs, and it's the same company. Um, they're the, the group that brings us all of our digital uh, forms. They're super innovative, so they're going to have a um, kickoff meeting on site here at the end of September. Uh, or they're hoping to, and each department will have a chance to meet with them. And um, like I said, the, the individuals that are running it are, are really energetic. They want to make things as easy as possible. So each department's going to have a, a custom approach at how uh, their site is being offered. And someone like OREC or other departments that might have their own separate website, they're going to come up with probably the easiest solution to make it work. And in a lot of cases, I think Seamless will probably have a solution for making it better. Great. Thank you. Um, so the resolution to where the contract has been moved and seconded. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Next is 17 to 60, resolution authorizing the award of the 2017 sidewalk contract to PA Contractors Incorporated of Newark, New Jersey, in an amount not to exceed $309,090. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Ms. Kremler and seconded by Ms. Howard. Any questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Next is 17261, resolution authorizing the award of the 2017 Storm Sewer Improvement Project contract to Integrated Construction and Utilities of New Jersey LLC, ICUNJ, Edison, New Jersey, in an amount not to exceed $271,806. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Ms. Crummeler. Second. Seconded by Ms. Howard. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, resolution passes unanimously. Next is 17262, resolution authorizing state contract number 86391 with CMZ's uniforms for the purchase of uniforms and equipment for police department employees in an amount not to exceed $55,000. So a motion to approve? Second, I mean, so so moved. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, moved by Mr. I thought, Liverman. I thought Tim, I was, this is how bad it's getting. Second. I thought Tim's mouth was saying motion. I was going to second it, but no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moved sort of by Mr. Liverman. <laughs> and then seconded by Ms. Crumiller. Any uh, questions, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Um, and next is 17266, resolution approving settlement of litigation entitled Avalon Princeton LLC versus Princeton et al. Docket number MERL 941-17. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, moved by Mr. Miller and seconded by Ms. Crummiller. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Now we come to the consent agenda, which contains items of a routine nature, passed by single vote. Are there any items on the consent agenda anybody would like removed? 
Um, Mayor, I move we adopt them in block. Okay. Yeah, so it's been normal. moved by Ms. Howard and seconded by Mr. Miller. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, consent agenda passes unanimously. And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Miller, seconded by Ms. Butler. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>